So welcome back to the afternoon session for Temple's 12th annual faculty conference on teaching excellence. Um, we have about 250 people here today when we include those who joined us via WebEx. So we um, had a great day and we hope that, um, that you enjoy the final session. So the mission of the Temple Teaching Learning Center is to foster excellent teaching so that our students learn and develop and succeed. And we're so grateful to have the support of Temple's Chief Academic Officer, Provost Tai Lung Dai. Good afternoon. I, uh, <clears throat> 10 minutes ago, I walked from my office to here, a blocks away. I thought that this is just another Friday, cold Friday afternoon before student returns people, and I came here, and I was totally shocked. No wonder there's few people on the street. We're all here. And I was particularly impressed by uh, what Pamela told me, that uh, nearly half of you actually came outside of Temple. So I asked Pamela that, uh, what did you do to bribe them? <clears throat> Why would they come here? Do they get a certificate? Do they get a nice dinner? None of that. And she said, because you all care about teaching. And uh, that's the highest professionalism that I would uh, say that you have to display as a teacher. Uh, I uh, I have a weird name, Hai Long Dai. And uh, literally pronounces as like I, long, and then die. <laughs> so easy to remember. I wasn't born in the United States. I was born in Taiwan. In fact, I didn't uh, came to the States until I finished the college education. And so uh, the education system, as well as teaching here, uh, has been uh, quite a puzzle to me. For example, right, that uh, uh, for our pre-college teachers, they all trained through education school. And uh, they know all the teaching methods, teaching theory, but very often uh, there is a lack of content uh, in the discipline that they teach. Come to college, it's 180 degree reverse, right? That we are all content specialists. A few of us have had the chance to get in touch with teaching theory, teaching practices. I recall my uh, uh, first day as a professor, assistant professor, this is across the town at the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> so the chairman welcomed me and uh, took me to the laboratory and said, this is the place you're going to establish your research. And, uh, and then, right, all the other administrative things. And then, at the end, of, oh, by the way, you're going to teach this course. It's an afterthought teaching. And so I went into the classroom. I actually, uh, paid some attention to what I'm going to teach. I taught, and Valentine, Professor Valentine from chemistry department, so she understands what I'm going to say. I actually was assigned to teach a, uh, a general honors chemistry. And so <clears throat> I thought that uh, this is a student's clean-up crop like, uh, uh, from a clean-up crop student uh, at Penn. So I, <clears throat> I actually designed a uh, well-thought-out general chemistry curriculum. I thought we should start from the discovery of electrons and nucleus, and then we form the atom, and atom and atom I combine together, become molecules. And then molecules and molecules uh, combine uh, or group together and become matters. So I had this curricula and then I thought this. By the way, this curricula, this outline has been adopted now today in many uh, textbooks. I didn't say that I'm the uh, first one, but uh, many people share the same idea. And I remember I taught this course. Uh, and, uh, one third into the semester, uh, 
type of a student went to see the department chair? Hey, Professor Dai not, was not teaching chemistry. They were expecting acid and base will give you water or balance of equations. And here is this guy telling us that electrons, wave functions. And so uh, our department chair sent a senior professor sat in my classroom for two weeks, and he reported nothing wrong with what I thought. And I was warned that by our department chair, saying, no matter how good a research you do, if you do a lot of teaching, you won't get any. So just imagine what this would done to, to, to the first year assistant professor. Uh, and I was, that semester, the worst rated professor in the department. Uh, so, so I thought, why? I, I was very, uh, serious about my teaching. I, uh, uh, I care about uh, what I taught. And then I realized, I mean, America. America, not everything, but I still say it. Everything is about packaging, about marketing. So I have to, I figure out that, uh, uh, and so I thought it through and I decided I did two things. One is, the first day of the class, I laid out the entire outline. So instead of moving along the line, right, the student, right, was looking at the electrons, not knowing what, they have, what the electrons will lead them to. Okay, so I laid out the outline from beginning at, at, to the end. So that's one thing. And so they know what to anticipate. And at the end of the course, then I told them the requirement of chemistry knowledge by the School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania. Because a lot of these students are female. Right? So they were they were thinking that, right, this professor was teaching irrelevant things to us. Right? He was a philosopher and had nothing to do with uh, our future. So I laid out to them that, right, I read the list this, that uh, the medical schools, I actually expect you to know about thermodynamics, reaction kinetics, chemical bonding, intermolecular forces, Right, atomic structure, molecular structure, etc. So at the end, they say, wow, okay, this is really a very nice course. This right, really laid the foundation for everything we should know about chemistry to go to medical school. So that semester, everything else being the same, okay, except for the first and the last lecture. I was the second highest rated in the department. And of course, Later on, uh, I learned right, that the teaching is not just the packaging. The teaching uh, is about uh, a lot of, the, of this is how do you interact in effectively with students in the classroom. In chemistry, that, uh, uh, I founded my, uh, myself, I founded the Science Teacher Institute at Penn, and uh, we actually uh, uh, borrowed very heavily the inquiry-based uh, teaching and learning methods. And uh, in training in service science people at that time. And so uh, from this, I actually learned that uh, that uh, how do you conduct the teaching? Not just the packaging uh, has really a, uh, uh, a strong uh, impact on how students will learn. So uh, I I look at you and I know that you are very very serious about teaching. That's why you're here, and uh, I uh, want to. Uh, offer my admiration and uh, hope that uh, you do feel that you have uh, uh, earned uh, the, uh, uh, the what you expect by right, today. Uh, thanks to Pamela Barnett, uh, uh, very thoughtful arrangement of this. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see you next year at Temple again. Thank you. So I promised you, you learned the first three of the seven research-based principles this morning. Now you will learn the other four from Dr. Michele to Pietro. So Michele is the Executive Director of the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Kennesaw State University, where he is also an Associate Professor of Math and Statistics. 
Um, he is the immediate past president of the POD Network, Professional and Organizational Development Network, which is really the premier organization for faculty development in the country. Um, as we know, Dr. DiPietro is a co-author of this book, but also um, published on, on these issues of teaching and learning. And I just learned that some of his work has been translated into foreign languages, including Chinese, Italian, Korean, Hebrew, and forthcoming in Japanese. So the word is getting out there internationally, which is wonderful. Um, he has won a POD Innovation Award for his online consultation tool, Solve a Teaching Problem. And for those of you who read the Chronicle and other um, mags about higher ed, you may have learned about his innovative course, The Statistics of Sexual Orientation. So he does very interesting, innovative work as a teacher and a scholar, and we welcome Dr. Michele Di Pietro. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being here. You're the ones who are sticking it out until the end. Um, and so we're going to learn more about the principles. I just want to add uh, to the very nice introduction that uh, actually the international staff, the Chinese, the Korean, the Japanese, and the Innovation Award is all uh, collaborative um, achievements because it's, it's the book that got all those things. So with Marsha and, and everybody else who wrote it. Um, before we get to the, the rest of the principles, I have been tasked with a very nice um, task which is to announce the winner of the Foster competition. You visited and rated and submitted all your ballots, and we counted them, they counted them. And the winner of that is um, the poster titled Integrating Ecological Literacy and Teacher Education, the Experimental Platform, from, um, by Andrea Kornbluh, Instructor of Biological Sciences at Rowan University. Andrea here. Come <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations. And the winner of this gets an iPad mini. <laughs> it's just a little, little gag. No, 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 no. Don't go anywhere. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is your real iPad mini. That's the little thing <laughs> that the folks from the Berkeley College were handing out. <laughs> All right. I'm a little prankster sometimes. Um, so what we talked about this morning, what Marsha talked about and uh, everybody discussed, um, she was able to bring you all those um, demos and experiments from cognitive psychology, and all those involve getting the students in the room and asking them to work on a little problem from solving and seeing what we can learn from that. But actually, all of us who are in the classroom, we know that real life is more complicated, more complex than that. It, it's longer. It's not just one person. It's, it's, it's a community that stays together for a semester where all kinds of issues come up that go beyond the point. And so this afternoon, we'll explore um, everything else. And so that's why this is titled Motivation and Development. Working with us today. Oh, okay, good. So we'll focus on uh, the principle of motivation. So this principle says that motivation is a big determinant of student learning, as well as um, the student level of development, their personal maturity and growth matters, and the way it plays out in the um, social, emotional, intellectual planet of the whole classroom, of course. And finally, uh, we all want our students to be lifelong learners and take responsibility and have some self-direction. And so the seven principles talks about what needs to happen for that learning to continue even after instruction and, and college and university is over. So let's start with motivation. And let me see if we can do a little brainstorming. The reason why we care about motivation is because we know that motivated people have certain um, goal-directed behaviors. So what are the, some of the behaviors that you're hoping to see from your students if they were really motivated? All right, engagement, doing their homework, asking questions. <laughs> yes, so you stay home and, and do the homework and won't go partying because you know that that's better for you in the end. 
little bit of turning to me, but not too much. All right. Anything from the uh, box at a distance? No. Okay. I'll check in with you uh, occasionally for that. So that's what we want. And when we do this listening, we could go on and on um, making that list. But then I look at lists like that, and I think of myself as a very motivated person, at least for the things that interest me. I don't have the same both behaviors all of the time. Um, and my students don't either, and I'm guessing your students don't. And so the first lesson out of motivation is actually to kind of revise our expectations and and um, have a more realistic image of what a motivated student uh, looks like beyond those idealized people that we might put on the pedestal. And the big thing is that there's a huge distinction between us and our students. We are not our students. In many ways, and one of the ways is the level of motivation. All of us, I'm going to say, and generalize, but I agreed to be poor for four, five years <laughs> to study statistics, which I love. Uh, very few of our students would sign up for that. That's how much I was motivated. Um, so what that means is that students might come in with a certain level of motivation, and then we have to do some extra work to get them more motivated. So I'm curious, what are some of the things that you do that you have found uh, effective in the kind of subject matter that you teach to get the students more motivated? And then we'll see how they tie into what the research says. All right. Modeling. Oh, okay. Thank you, Carl. Over here. Oh, okay. I try to listen to what their expectations are and what they want and respond to that first. And then I get myself in it. <laughs> Framing the things that we care about in, 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 in terms that they care about. Absolutely. I, uh, I give them uh, assignment options where they can choose from their interest in topics. They choose the topics. Okay. So it plays to their interest. It plays to their uh, – it gives them a sense of control. Mine's similar to his, but more broad. Allow them um, participation in the decision-making process in general as a group. I try to uh, broaden the audience of their work to beyond just me, be it their peers or public or other members of the domain. Interesting. Making them realize that they're safe. This is not just idle. People listen to you when you speak. What I try to do is try to make things fun for them, especially if it's a very, very bright topic. Whether it be games, you know, it might seem simplistic, but it seems cool. Fun. Okay. Give me a couple more, and then move on from this. Anything from the distance part? Right? So relevance to their life and relatable to their interests. Those are all great ideas. So let me see if we can categorize that in terms of, of what the research says. So rather than go through all the theories of motivation and lecture you about that, which is not really the point, um, when we were doing this kind of this review work, we realized that most theories talk about motivation in two ways, the expectancy and the value. The value side is very intuitive. We are motivated to do the things that we value, that we care about. And so the question there becomes, how can you make students care about things that on paper they don't? Required courses and so on and so forth. On the expectancy side, the lesson there is that we are motivated to do things where we think we have a reasonable expectation of success. If we think it's not going to work out, then as rational beings, we have limited um, energies and resources. We choose to allocate them where we have the most time to go students. And so the question is, how can you uh, convince students that they will 
uh, be successful. The ones who maybe say, I'm just not a math person, that's not for me, kind of thing. Um, so let's explore both sides. So on the, the, the value side of the both sides, the first um, lesson out of that literature is that students must find some kind of value. If they don't, then there's, there's just a non scatter They won't engage. Um, what, did you, what do your students call things that they have to do that are meaningless for, for school? Busy work. They hate busy work, right? So you must find, we must all find ways to add value to that. But the good news is that students value multiple goals. So we can talk about what those are. But the lesson there is to, acti is to not activate goals that might be in competition for each other. So for instance, if I'm paying somebody by the hour, I'm activating, I'm conflicting uh, two values, the value of getting paid the most by the value of doing the job, their job in the time detection. That would be one lesson. Um, when it comes to the classroom, what have you found that students value in your field? What do they want to know or learn or do or be or... Yes. Earning power, yes. It comes down to the dollar sign, absolutely. That's certainly why in this economic times for sure. Yes. How it applies to the job. Uh-huh. They want to know what's going to be on the test. Absolutely. Whether it's the big, um, uh, the standardized test or even the test in the sport. They definitely want to know that. I guess their attention. They value that. Mm -hmm. What do you teach? Okay. They want to know that it's real, that they're not wasting time following some person's hypothetical ideas. Mm -hmm. What's in it for them? Uh huh. Or how to get it? Because they value getting high grade. Anything else from? So skills for their careers and how the material will impact their everyday life. Now, when people talk about motivation, I don't tend to use those words as much, but they talk about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And most of the things that you said, it's not everything, speaks to the extrinsic motivation. How much money is this thing going to make me? What grade will it get me? Versus, as a mathematician, the beauty and the elegance of the formulas, right? Nobody cares about that. <laughs> Um, I don't use those terms, and then obviously the intrinsic is the good stuff and the extrinsic is bad. I prefer to talk about instrumental motivation. I care about this end goal, becoming a doctor. So I know that all can is a sign pass on that way. I don't necessarily care about all can per se, but it will get me where I want to go. So in that sense, I actually will take that. That's good. Um, it's not just the level of chemistry itself. Because, again, I chose to be poor for, for, for five years uh, because, because of my love, but that's not something that the students have. So when we talk about what students value, we mention some of the things, rewards and punishment will be the first year coming out of 
the experiments in the 50s with the uh, mice and the maize. And if they go this way, they get the cheese, and if they go this way, they get shot. Um, so when we transfer that, so the thinking must have been, eh, good for the mouse, good for the seed. Um, <laughs> so you start to see already the pitfalls of thinking that way. Um, but the, the rewards and punishments would be the grades that you've mentioned. It might be attention, and from whether it's praise or whether it's a um, um, shame from the instructor. Um, the problem with using those theories um, is that students are not animals, first of all, and, and just animals. But at the same time, that rewards and punishments are very effective at a very uh, big motivator. They're motivated to get the reward and avoid the punishment. And learning is entirely incidental, it's orthogonal. So if I really value getting an A, I could decide I'm going to study really hard, or I can say I'm going to cheat my way to it. Um, if, I, if my professor calls calls on, on students and I change them if they don't have the right answer, I could decide to be uh, very prepared all the time, every day, or I could decide to skip both. Both strategies get me out of that punishment, uh, and only one leads to learning. So that's clearly not the um, optimal. Some students do love learning for its own sake. Students, in general, like to feel competent, like to say that they're good at what they like. I, I started something I want to finish. I'm not a quitter. We all have that, or especially in America, in the American culture, we have that orientation. Uh, we don't want to lose face with the professor, so that we can do something, so that's something that we can leverage. Um, some students are motivated to approach performance, go toward it, and do and go the extra mile. The teacher said some students are motivated as a sort of a personality orientation to do the minimum and just skate by and then move on to other things that they really like, avoiding performance. There's also a ton of um, social and effective goals that go on in the classroom. People want to belong. People want to feel like the same as everybody else. They're just as much. They got here for the good reason. Uh, they also like to feel better than everybody else. Uh, and that's, again, think about activating goals without any competition. Um, they like to take to the group. They like to give to the group. Take from the group and give to the group. And when those are out of balance, then you get the problems of social loafing, etc. cetera. Um, they're trying to figure out, especially um, traditional, traditional age students, they're trying to, they're finding themselves trying to figure out who they're going to be, the kind of person they want to be in the world, and how what they're learning in school will orient them toward a career that will fulfill their goals. They might be spiritual, um, and just goals of integrity, and then just how they operate in the world, and then justice and fixing the problems and so on and so forth, or just make more money for themselves and get out of that. All those things matter. The lesson out of this line of... Um, uh, Converging scholarship is that students have a mental scorecard. So let's imagine two different situations. Here's one professor saying, here's this homework. I don't really understand what that is, but it comes from the grade to do the work. So I'm saying I do want to get a good grade, so this will get me there. So I'm scoring 100 points in my head for this homework if I can get me to that goal that I want. Here's another assignment in a different class where it also counts for the grade. So I still have 100 points for that. But it's also fun, as you were saying. I like having fun while I study. So I'm scoring an extra 25 points for fun. And it actually matters. It will prepare me for my job. And I see the best 500 points right there. And I get to work in groups and make friends. So that's another 100 points. Oh, but in my group, there's that person who never does his work. And I have, and I have to do all his work. So that's a minus 50. Um, but you can start to see how these things build up in even sub unconsciously or subconsciously sometimes. But this one is going to have a net motivational score much higher than this one. And so I'm going to choose this one. And then when I'm done with this, I still have time and energy, I'll work on that one. That's basically how we operate. Now, my sense, having talked to many professors, is that this homework over here is misunderstood. We're not crazy. We don't give students homework that's just meaningless. So sometimes it's just that the students don't see those things. This one also will prepare you in some ways, maybe in ways that are a little more latent. 
because it builds habits of reason, like the math person from been saying uh, that um, it's a little harder to make them see how math will help them in their lives, but it will. Um, and so it's a matter of making those links explicitly. So when the students are making their mental scorecards, uh, then ding, 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 all those points ring. So that's the lesson out of this on the scholarship. On the other side of being um, successful, that actually gets broken down in three different expectations or expectancies that need to line up. So let's explore them one by one. The first one is the outcome expectancy. It's a causal belief that connects two things. So that certain behaviors are connected to certain outcomes. If I want A, I really value A, and I know that B gets its way, I'm going to be really motivated to do B. Okay? I'm going to say that we in higher education have it generally good. People understand that there is a link between studying, practicing, and learning, and performance, and expertise. Think about um, the people who spend their lives trying to get other people to quit smoking. People don't believe that smoking is bad for you. First, they have to make a big case of that why that's actually true. And they always have their uncle who's bought all their lives and didn't get lung cancer. And then they have the other uncle who did not smoke, but did get cancer. And so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so we don't start there. Or recycling. We have to spend millions of dollars in campaigns to convince people that recycling is good. Because they say in the beginning, they were saying, it's just a bottle, it's just a can, it doesn't really make a difference. So they were motivated in that behavior, even if they really valued the idea of preserving the environment, let's say. They just weren't convinced that the link was there. So we kind of have that link, except we don't have it for everything. So attendance, is that really necessary? Do the students believe that? Um, doing the readings ahead of time or not leave them until the end, um, working in groups. What what are some of the things that you know are good for your students but your students resist them because they maybe they don't see the link toward um, learning? Absolutely. They get so embarrassed maybe. They think they're going wrong with that question. They don't want to look good. They think they can figure it out later on on their own. It doesn't really matter if they ask questions. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Because they don't know about attentional capacities and how limited they are. Yes. Absolutely. So, this is another non-starter. If people don't believe in that causal link, they will not engage in that behavior, no matter how much they might value the angle. So one way in which we can motivate our students is to actually make, keep making that case. And it might be a hard case to make, and we, that means we need to keep making that case. So let's say that we've got them to buy into this, this idea. Then the next question, the next level of the expectancy, of building that expectancy of success, is convincing people that they actually have what it takes to do the work. The people who say, I'm just not a math person. The people who say, well, writing is kind of a gift. Some people have it and I don't have it. Um, they don't have that self efficacy Now, the research on this is actually disappointing. It's really hard to change self-efficacy. Uh, just saying, oh, no, no, everybody can do that. Maybe not like Einstein like that, but, you know, half one, everybody can do that. If you've got admitted, you can do it. That does nothing to change people's self-efficacy. Um, why? Because they have reinforced and rehearsed that message for themselves for 20 years now. Their parents told them so, their teachers told them so. It's become a big identity statement. This is who I am as a person. Those kind of statements are any kind of identity statements are really happy. Okay? But the, the research shows that they can be changed, but it needs to be very intentional 
and it needs to be um, collected. So the whole curriculum might need to understand that we have a bunch of students that come in with math anxiety, let's say, and all of us are addressing this into this. In every course that we teach, they see that. They, and we're providing early success opportunities so the students can start, ch you know, challenging that self-concept. Um, but it's, it's, it's a communal enterprise. And it is possible. But it's hard. The third part is saying, okay, I do have what it takes, I can do it, but will you meet me halfway if I engage? So will the environment be supported? In this case, the environment is primarily the professor and maybe the other students if there's group activities and so the TAs. This is the good news again. If we control the environment as professor. Those are the messages that we provide about how fair the instructor is, how appropriate the workload is. Um, I find for this one, I don't know if anybody here, but I find that there is a mismatch between what I think is appropriate and what the students think is appropriate to assign for a week. And so I tell them, Carnegie Mellon actually has it designed as not as credit hours, but as a quality point. Uh, and just taking a nine, instead of a three credit course, it's a nine uh, unit course. And nine units means nine hours. So if you're in class for two and a half hours, I means they're doing homework for six and a half hours on the class every week. So I can fall back on that. I could fall back on that when I was there. Now I can't, but I still make that analogy. Three credits equals nine hours. Uh, and I find that students resist that in the beginning, and I have to work at establishing that. I ask them, how long did it take you? Oh, it took us a long time. How long? Was it longer than six and a half hours? Well, no. Okay, so then we're right on track. But do let me know if it goes over, because I am committed to keeping this at that level. So I need to know if I'm off base. So do tell me. But you do owe me those six and a half hours every week. Um, helpfulness, approachability. So those are all things that you control by the tone that you use in your syllabus, by the way you interact with your students, and so on and so forth. Putting everything together. This is a two by two by two table that talks about, starting at the left, what happens to a student who does not see the value of math, let's say, like he's math and math has low self-efficacy and nothing in the environment will support them. Reject them. I'm going to doctor class, change my major. What's the point? Um, the student who, who um, still doesn't do math, doesn't care for math, but thinks they can do it, you're not going to help them. Evading. They will do the, the minimum to get by and then move on to the things that they really do like. When they love math, but they cannot do math, and you're not going to help them do math, that's the hope for a student. And then down here, love math, can do math, um, and you're not going to help them. That's the student who says, and I hear this when I go to conferences, and I talk to women of a certain age who tell me they were told, you're not going to be a mathematician because you're one. It's just how it is. Make peace with that fact. And they, they told me, many of them say that they were this kind of student. I'll show you. Okay? Now, that's a good student. That could actually be a good motivational strategy. That student will do well. But look at this last square. If the environment, the people see you as non-supportive, the most you can hope for is a few defined students. And then rejecting, evading, uh, hopeless students. It's only when they see you as supportive, that some things start to change. If you still haven't managed to make them see the point of what you're teaching them, nothing is changing over here. But the student who was hopeless um, now actually can succeed because they see that you're supportive. You will have them. That's the student who sent you an email and said, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I raised up this class three times and I failed. And I didn't think I could do it, but you helped me. And you wouldn't let me leave your office hours until I really understood. You know, forever grateful. That's kind of thing. Um, and finally, down here, it's the um, planetary alignment. And <laughs> when they, they, they've seen the value of your subject, you've made them see that. And you have uh, convinced them that they can do it. And they, and they, you know, you will help them. That's a truly motivated student who will 
rise to the occasion and do all those things that you were um, saying in the brainstorming initially. And so the, the biggest advice that I have out of this research is to actually be seen as supportive. So we'll see more about that, but um, how you're seen is a matter of perception. And so the lesson there is you might think you're being supportive, but you want to check your messages with your students because perception is reality. These are some of the lessons from uh, the motivational aspect. Let's talk a little bit about um, the student level of maturity and how that impacts what they can do in the classroom. I didn't know the provost was going to take um, a bunch of time, so I had a case study for you to read, but instead, um, I'm going to ask you to read the poem on the, on the, on the um, screen inside. In the interest of time, because I want to let you leave by the side. Um, we're going to talk about some ideas about intellectual development and then also social identity development and stereotype threat without the aid of the case study. But read this poem and see what this says to you. Let's react to this. What reactions do you have to this form? Natural reactions, emotional reactions? Absolutely, and I need to contextualize that um, as an old form from the 50s, that might have been acceptable then. The, the 20 is the, um, the title of the poem. That the encyclopedia was the World War of 1978. So they came with updates, right? She, she had in her family, in her um, studio, in her father's studio, she had the um, But yes, there are implications. So gypsies are not trustworthy. She doesn't trust the fact that come along when you don't invite them, you don't expect them. Um, and, um, I don't subscribe to that characterization of um, wrong people, but um, um, minus that, that's how she's thinking of that at that point in the poem, for sure. Um, I have a 14-month-old, and so I was thinking about how, like, everything he does is learning and how it's, like, it's easy to watch, but he doesn't really have to make an effort at all. So it's like an ask to learn something now, so mm -hmm. get out there and make a real effort to Find what I need. Absolutely. Learning can be effortful or easy, depending on our situation. It makes me remember, like, the first time I learned something that had ambiguity, and I was like, oh, dang, this is hard. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from simplistic topic to one clear right answer. When we get to higher education, a lot of things are, there's complexity, there's different sides, multiple sides, more than just two even. And how do the students make sense of all of that? How do they hold that complexity in their head? It's a function of their level of maturity. So I'm going to say that there's a switch here, right here, and then it switches to the second side. One side, there's no ambiguity, and that's what makes learning effortless and pleasurable. On the other side, more ambiguity. And that's what makes it real, but also she doesn't really like it as much in this form, but it has to be that way. She, she longs for the days of um, when it was easy. Where are your skills? That's the right. Ideally, even minus the emotional stuff, we want to graduate then to the right. 
even though we understand they are on the left. So the question becomes, how do you flip this switch from left to right? It turns out you don't actually flip the switch. It's not a switch. It's a, it's a, it's a long, drawn-out process that actually goes on even after you're, you're done with college. You developing and growing and maturing intellectually your whole life. And so there's um there's different theories that have described tried to describe that trajectory. The first one uh was the Perry scheme. Uh he did interviews, there was a longitudinal study, he talked to students every semester to see how they were growing and maturing. Uh but it was students at Harvard, so that means they were white, wealthy, male students. So there were three keys of that study, and then what the study was going on later on in the 80s with women, women who went to college, women who didn't go to college, with the question of what, what happens to people who don't go to college, they go on this year, um, and then it was done in other ways. Now the good news, if you look at this table, that they found more or less the same stages, with maybe some stages here and there. So let's look at the stages. The first stage is where you, you were saying that your students are. He called it dualistic, many people called it other things. But the idea is that knowledge is, it's a very quantitative view of knowledge. Knowledge is a collection of facts. Okay, knowledge is handed down, it's a capital key tool. And your role as a learner is to memorize all these things and build up a base of truth in your head. Um, especially if you're a woman, then your role is just to sit back and not politely and not say much at all. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm being sarcastic here, but that's why the feminist critique called it received knowledge. Um, the teacher has all the answers. How does the teacher have all the answers? Because maybe the teacher studied all the good books. Well, how are those books right? Well, because the good, the previous good people with all the answers wrote those books, put them down on paper. And the question of knowledge creation doesn't never really come up in this case. Knowledge exists, and the assumption is that all that is knowable is known. And when we engage in very good pedagogical techniques like Socratic dialogue and turn it back on the student and say, well, what do you think? Students at this stage hate it. It's a big waste of time. Why are you asking me? I don't know. They come here in school to learn from you. I'm just going to go around in circles and flounder and try and get it wrong for 15 minutes, and then you're going to have to tell me anyway at the end. Just tell me now. <laughs> um, or when we have guest lecturers, guest instructors, and we engage them and debate them and try to present opposite views, and all they're thinking is, well, which one of you is right? What should I write on the test, right, um, at this stage? Eventually, they realize that we do not have a yes, and they move on to a stage where there's just one little change, where some knowledge is certain, some knowledge is answered. Maybe we don't have all the answers. We haven't started that thing, but we could start and then find out. Um, so not much has changed at all. With more and more cracks in that wall of certainty, we realize, and for instance, in many fields, there are different camps, there are different perspectives, and they are irreducible. As a statistician, I could adopt the classical frequentist perspective, or I could do the Bayesian perspective, and I switch back and forth uh, as an effective statistician, and neither one is better. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, one would have eradicated the other one. One was the best. Um, and we keep teaching all perspectives because each one has something. So, when that hits them, that realization hits them, they move on the multiplicity stage. Multiplicity is when there's multiple possibilities. It's still very much a quantitative of knowledge. Now I had to memorize all the things that make up, you know, the frequency perspective and all the theorems and things that make up the major perspective in statistics and similarly for other fields. So it's overwhelming, actually. Um, but basically what this means and this might be more true in the humanities because they're taught more that way in this day and age. But is that knowledge is a matter of opinion. Well, then it's whatever you think. There's really no rule. Um, this is the student who will tell you, I just wrote what I believe, how I feel. How, how can you say that's a school? Yeah, I see the heads nodding. Yes. Um, 
And so that's a big frustration. You don't really see in this state how that's possible to attach a grade to um, a paper like that. It's hard to see how this stage is moving forward, but it is in two ways. One way is that it opens the door to the idea that other people might have a valid point. Before, we found right everybody else is wrong because it's black and white. The second point is that if different people can have valid points and disagree with each other, I can disagree with the textbook, with the professor, but actually has an empowering stage. It might feel strange for us to be on the receiving end when they're coming at us with that empowerment but lacking the substance of justifying what their disagreements with actual data and evidence and so on. So that's not present at this stage at all. That's the next stage. Relativism. This is the big shift. This is shifting more to the right of that poem. Um, it's a qualitative view of knowledge. What matters is not how many facts you have piled up, but how you connect them, connect the dots, and use them, and what you do with that knowledge, and how you apply and use it in its arguments and interpretations and inferences, and so on. This is the kind of teachers that we want to be, right? The conversation partners, the guides. Um, the danger of this stage is intellectual paralysis. Because the exercise can become of understanding that, you know, if different perspectives have pros and cons, I mean, it's all the pros of doing it this way, and all the cons, and all the pros of this way and that way. Well, which one do I do? As a statistician, I have my data. The data just came in. I have to analyze it. Do I analyze it in the Bayesian way? Do I analyze it in the frequency way? I will get different results. I can tell you what I gain and what I lose by each one, but I have to pick one. Yeah. And that's the last thing. Commitment. Commitment is the idea that we need to take one side. Because we need to act, otherwise we're not acting or paralyzed. But it's a nuanced understanding. We're coming full circle, taking one over everything else. But it's a nuanced understanding. It's a provisional commitment. Because if more evidence comes up, I might actually change. My, it's not a blind commitment. I might change my perspective, my size, and so on. Um, interestingly, one of the studies try to actually quantify what we've done. So the same students, the same 101 students through the years interviewed, they were tracking which students had each perspective. How do you make sense of this graph? Take it in, different colors of different years, and then see what jumps up at you. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it starts to look a little more like that flip, flipping that switch. But only at the end. It's like you need to build up some kind of, um, uh, uh, um, critical mass. The tipping point, right? Kind of idea. What about the purple? Yeah. Oh. In this particular study, most of them actually had graduated and were, were out in the real world, quote unquote, and few of them went to graduate school. Yes. Um, I will add that blue really dies out. That completely black and white view of the world dies out, which is one of the big benefits of college. If you look at the um, big debates in the country right now, I would say gun control, same-sex marriage, uh, the global warming, um, they are all debated in the national news from that blue perspective. I'm right, everybody else is wrong. Um, so that dies out. That's one of the big benefits of college, actually. But the purple and the yellow, which is the things that we really want, they really struggle to come out, and that's going to start coming out after college. After college is the real world. 
So when you're given a task by your boss, you say, hey, I need a report on this data by the end of the week. But that's not enough time. I, I, I need to do other things. I could do this. I know I could do this analysis and that and the other one that I learned before. I just don't have enough time. I need to report by Friday. So you need to act in uncertain conditions uh, without all the resources that you have, understanding there will be consequences that this report will actually have a shelf life and impact other people. There will be monetary consequences and so on and so forth. That is what makes you start thinking more in that way. That what matters is what I do with my knowledge and which of all the possible data analysis that I could do, which one I pick between now and Friday. Okay? Yeah, question? Um, Absolutely. So you want the purple to be higher and higher. So yellow will also have some light that will go up, and then ideally you will see the yellow come down and the purple keep going up. If we had cut years six and seven and eight and nine, the the moral out of these stories is that what we want doesn't really happen in the four years of college, and people keep maturing all their lives. That's the big moral. But this study was also very influential because the question here became, and that's the question that I have for you, how can I bring then year five thinking into college? I hate to admit this, but I'm starting to see an evolution as a teacher as well. Meaning? Like when I, because I've been teaching about 32 years, and when I first started teaching, and then, you know, after 10 years, and then after 20 years, and now it's been after 30 years, I see myself more. In the but as a teacher, I was more. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, in the literature, there are developmental models for teachers as well. We all go through phases. The first phase would be to not look stupid in front of our students. So we spend all our time rehearsing all our facts and all our dates and all our fear, and, and that's what we worry about. When, when we're up there. Once we figure out we have those basics down, then we're like, oh, there's students. And nobody's talking when I ask questions. So then it's like, oh, how can I get students to talk? <laughs> and then they're like, okay, they're talking now. There's a flow to the conversation that I've been really learning. How can I find out more about whether the wheels are turning? So we ourselves keep asking those, yes. So we're not, so it's not surprising in a sense that there's only very little purple comparatively. And year five. Year five is like 22. <laughs> We're not done maturing at 22. So, <laughs> um, but the question is, how can we bring more of this into it? And everything that we've seen in the 90s and 2000s about this has to do with that idea. Um, internship, service learning, undergraduate research, um, study abroad. Those are all things like you're out there in the community, you're seeing the needs, you're seeing, you're thrown to the walls in a strange nation, you barely speak the language, survive now. Now you're going to have to make decisions and really use that knowledge wisely. Um, two things. Are there any comparisons to students that aren't in college? Meaning, is there, there's a trajectory, trajectory in terms of positive development in general? in terms of that thinking, number one. And number two, given the big jump in year five, which is primarily real-world experiences, what you just said about internships, would that be a way to get that purple up mm -hmm. faster by integrating that sooner and then going to on that? Um, I don't know that people have explicitly mapped internships to levels of cognitive development. So, um, there's an intuitive answer to that. The people, this study was influential, influential in that sense, sort of putting that bug in people's ears. Um, other than sort of the things that we see, we know that we keep pushing study abroad and other research because we see the good. And students are in the lab doing the research and realize that the answer is not in the back of the book. 
I couldn't point you to specific studies. Um, the other question that you had, trajectories for different um, groups you were talking about? Students who aren't in college, is there a similar, like would I see the same chart? Would I see the same, is there a um, so the, 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 for the students who may go on to the painful, um who are not in college? Um, um, some of that, yeah. Or? So the, the, the women who are even all looked at that, and some of the trajectories um, were the same. That was also feminist study, so they looked at how is the women's trajectory different from the traditional men's trajectory. Um, and they also found a state for women of silence. So some of the women who didn't go to college were stuck in a pre-stage, pre of all of this, of silence. They had not found their voice to even start engaging at all in any kind of conversation of this kind. And some of them might get stuck there, but some others went on, just like this. So there wasn't much difference in the ones who went on. Um, but it's also possible in development to actually regress. Go back or temporize, spend way more time in a stage than other people would because you see what's coming and you don't like it, it's kind of scary. Um, development has that kind of um, idea. That was actually my first question. Is there anything, you know, what happens when these folks, you know, perfect research world, longitudinal study, these people are, when they, when they turn 40, where are they? Oh, that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that I do not know. Um, but William Perry talks about giving very, his full model is that actually has nine stages, and they, just a couple of people ended up at stage nine by the end of college. And he talks about how it was most of a compliment from the uh, investigators when they gave a man saying, this person, for whatever challenge they had in life, is more of a man than I am a man right now at this point in the study. Um, uh, I was just going to say, what about in today's economy this year, we see a lot of young people struggling to get a job out of college and, and they have to go back to their parents' house or whatever. So do we see that kind of regression when that happens in a lower economy or is that is that the case? Again, I'm not aware of um, specific studies that have been done looking at the unemployed and how that maps on to other levels of cognitive development. But in terms of the research on millennial students talks a little bit about that. Uh, in terms of the, the sort of the, the molly covering aspect of what happens when either our helicopter parents do everything for us, follow us to our job interviews, help us negotiate our salaries, or take us back in when we um, don't find a job. And the, 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 the clues are all in the direction of delaying that kind of development. So, so this is only one form of development. There's others, um, and this is an, this is a, this is one that you might see, uh, especially at a diverse institution such as Temple, when you have students from different groups interacting in a social environment in the classroom, um, and how they make sense of their social uh, social identity as members of a group, whether they're dominant group or stigmatized group because of their race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, and so on and so forth. So this model talks about people, everybody, starting at a naive stage. So when we see differences among different people and groups, but we don't ascribe particular meaning to those differences. But very soon, we're bombarded with messages by society, by the media, maybe in our families, maybe in our religious groups, in our educational institutions very early on, messages about certain groups, which groups are uh, smarter, uh, or lazy, or trustworthy, or a criminal, or uh, um, sinful, or sick, or beautiful, or and so on and so forth. And we internalize these messages, and we accept them. Members of dominant groups accept them. Members of stigmatized groups also internalize them and accept them as shame. And it can be a very active, like the KKK, let's say, uh, or it could be a more passive, like I'll pray for you, kind of. Um, statement, which I hear a lot since moving down to Georgia. Um, later on, when we are challenged by very visible inequalities, or we are challenged by positive encounters 
with members of other groups with whom we're planning and tackle this first around meaningful work, we might move on to a stage of resistance where we'll start questioning some of those messages. We might question them in a more active way, more passive way. Dom members of dominant groups might do that, members of stigmatized groups might do that. Uh, and then eventually, we move on to where those become just facets of our identity, um, and that doesn't work, and, and we come out with a positive sense of our membership in whatever group we have. Whether it's a group that's historically responsible for bad things, we overcome our shame, uh, and we get to work, or whether we are members of a group that's been stigmatized and we overcome all the negative messages and we come out with a positive sense of ourselves. Now, this is the end. Students are not going to be here, probably. Very few students are going to be down here. Many students are going to be in the acceptance and resistance stages when we are in college. Um, Michaela, you talked earlier when we were the, the, the Perry model about, you know, regression. And with these stage models, as you know, the, sometimes it seems as if there's, there are these stages, but it can be cyclical where they go back. But I think the word that someone used was regression. But as it relates to this model, how does this look when it's a the next um, stage of this of the stage model? So redefinition part two in the mature years. Could you just talk about that a little bit? If it's kind of like it becomes more mature when they kind of revisit that area, or is it that? Because I wouldn't imagine that it's like you move up the stage and then you stay there. It's kind of like you continue to go through it. So I just wanted you to speak to that a little bit in, in terms of your how you um, see it. Um, Thank you for that. That's, uh, that forced me to get a little more, um, on the, don't play as much cuts and loose as I have. These are earlier models of development. Earlier models are characterized by having all these stages, and it makes it look like you're climbing this ladder, and it's not necessarily that way. More, uh, modern models have emphasized the, uh, lifespan aspect of development. We keep going. So for instance, as a gay man, a crucial step if I take the model specific to gay people will be the coming out stage as a big stage that at some point I had to do to regain my sense of worth and esteem and whatnot. But other models emphasize how that's actually a lifelong practice. I'm always coming out. So every new person that I meet, I have to come out. But it changes. At some point I might have to say, listen, I'm gay. At a different point I'm saying, here's my husband. Because I got married, I have my ring now. I come out in a very different way. Now I'm saying, I worry about my daughter in this world because she has two dads. And uh, how is that going to impact it? So a very different way of reengaging that process and revisiting those cycles. So I'm contextualizing in, 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 as a gay man, but that would be kind of, uh, everybody will have to re-engage in, in, with, with multiple aspects of this at different points. In college, interestingly, the resistant aspect for members of stigmatized groups looks like spending a lot of time together. Because that's where you get the empowerment that you need to counter all the bad messages. Then you get all these questions, why do black people always self-segregate? And there's a wonderful book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, right? That's called the immersion stage, where you go in your group to re-emerge as a different person. Um, and empowered and starting to challenge your readings when you see evidence of racist statements or bias in your readings and so on and so forth. Um, at the same time, that stage feels very empowering to members of stigmatized groups. Members of dominant groups are going into a similar stage in college, which might wreck havoc in discussions, such discussions that will debate side that will use here, uh, because they're thinking, they had to come to terms with their own privilege and their role in supporting historical systems of um, um, inequity. And that stage is actually called disintegration in models of, let's say, white identity development. They're losing. It the, the feels like the right is being pulled out from under them. And so at the same time that you're seeing students challenging certain things, then you're seeing defensiveness in classroom discussion. So this, this model kind of helps explain the next kind of how that's coming to interact together to create certain standards. And then the role of the instructor in managing all those ideas so that everybody can hold 
the stage that they are in at this point and to not regress, keep moving forward, keep re-engaging and doing that cycle. And so here's the role of planning. Because those developmental things that maturity plays out in the social environment. And at first we kind of had a sense that bad things were happening in higher education and we documented some of the worst practices. But then later on we started having actual measurable research on how climate matters. It matters for critical thinking, preparation for a career, it matters for uh, learning in general, and, and it's well documented. And people think of climate as a binary thing, either good or bad, and bad means like the KKK, and I'm not like that sometimes. But actually, climate as degree, and so wherever we are, what's the next phase? In this particular study, People um, started the explicitly marginalizing study stage. So I, I worked with an instructor who said to the students, um, I don't believe in disability, so I don't offer accommodations, not even action. That's, that's this. That's an awful statement. That's an awful stage to be in. Um, he got a big talking to, because that's illegal. <laughs> I'm hoping nobody's in that stage here. Uh, and so he does offer accommodations now, but you can imagine that his the way he feels really hasn't changed. And so it's just, it's, he's here now. The next stage would be implicitly centralizing where I don't have specific messages uh, that I'm putting out, but when something comes up, let's go there. Let's explore. Yeah, it's a great point. You're right. Let's challenge that. Let's put a different perspective. And finally, like my course that, that Tamara mentioned, the statistics of sexual orientation explicitly tries to put a perspective that's usually marginalized at the center. Now, in this study, they explain the stages, and they ask the professors to uh, rate themselves, and the professors rated themselves between these two. And they asked the students. <laughs> the students were squarely here, implicitly marginalizing. So, another reminder that climate is made of perception. Climate is defined as the perception of climate in a, in a circular way. Um, and so, you want to check your perception. Because you think you're maybe doing well, but, but maybe you're not. Um, one way that I want to highlight is when we send messages, stereotypes, like you're a woman, you're not going to do that. And there's evidence now that when we activate stereotypes, like, hey, here's your final, everybody. Good luck, everybody, especially you women, because we know you're meant to them Now, I've, all, I've put women in the classroom under the threat of a stereotype, which... I, as the evaluator, can use as an explanation of their performance. That's why you did well or not well, because you're a model. Um, and it doesn't even matter if I believe the stereotype as a woman taking the exam, because what happens, study after study after study shows that members of stereotype groups in that situation do worse than non-stereotype people, but do also worse than members of the same group in the room next door where the stereotype is not activated. Those differences up there, the top ones, they're not significant. They're not significant. But the difference between this one and this one is, and this one and this one is. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if I just said, so there's, um, it's, being demonstrated on all these populations, and it should be blatant. That should be an error. It always changes from that to PC. It should be an error up and down. Um, it could be explicitly mentioned, the stereotype. Even if I said, good luck everybody, especially you women, and I stopped there without actually naming the stereotype, everybody knows why I said, especially you women. It's hanging in the air. That was the part of the first act for a stereotype threat, a threat in the air. Um, it's been done subliminally, like with Asian students, where you flash words on the screen to activate Asian math at a, at a subliminal speed that they cannot really register, or uh, like kimono, pagoda, chopsticks, <laughs> and then you see Dacrament in the, in the test course. It's been done with group composition. If you put a group of all women working on a problem, or a woman and three men, um, it, the woman does uh, words. So there's multiple ways, absolutely, in which this happens. Uh, and it impacts the number of correct answers on a, on a, on a test or the number of attempted questions. Um, 
some studies have found that actually performance could be boosted by activating certain good stereotypes. I have a problem talking about good stereotypes. That one in particular was about old people when they activated forgetfulness and they would do poorly on memory tests and when they activated uh, wisdom, um, then they would do better. Um, but if you, if you could do reverse stereotypes, so I can say, hey, good luck everybody, and on this math test, and you Asians, don't let me down. <laughs> and then the Asians are actually not performing now because there's this smoking effect. Absolutely. Um, people with double minority status, like say Latino women, you could measure the impact of being a woman and the impact of being Latino. For people with double minority, the, the, the effect is more than the sum of the two. Uh, it accumulates in very dangerous ways. And how that works is through uh, emotional pathways. You, it, it creates disruption in your head. You can think, oh my god, I can't believe he said that. Oh my god. He's going to be grading me and he thinks that I'm not going to do just because I'm, oh, I'll show him. Oh my god. And that's, that's your mental monologue instead of being, okay, problem one. <laughs> Find X. <laughs> and the consequences are disengagement from the mind, dropping out of college, um, all what documented things. Last one. What can we say about this one? Um, it's about self-direction. And so the, the, the term in the literature is metaphysical is awareness of yourself as a learner with particular strategies that you employ to, uh, to go about the business of learning. When I think this, we had to review all, this, all that literature and put it together in a way that makes it review all the strengths and put them together. So we came up with this topic. So let's say that if I want, I assign a big semester-long project in a statistics class, like a data analysis thing, I want the students to start by assessing the test. What is it that I'm really asking you? What's the research question? What's the data that I have? How will the data contribute to provide evidence in favor or against the, the hypothesis? What are the statistical procedures that will work? Uh, what, what is the computer skills involved in having to do all the statistical procedures? Um, how do I write this up in a report that makes sense that's convinced that argues from evidence? As soon as I start saying that, uh, then I need to know myself in relation to that. And so I would say, I don't know, um, oh, I'm good with the statistics, I understand that. Uh, not so much with programming all the analysis into the computer, so I'm going to need help for that. Um, and then writing, I hate writing, I know that I always do it for the last minute, so I'm going to give myself a deadline and give it to the professor so I can get feedback on the draft and then write it and go. So when you do that honestly, and you're able to do it well, immediately you have a plan already. Then you start working, you do everything that you learn in class, apply the strategies that you learn, and you monitor performance. And don't be like my students who think nothing and turning in homework where it says, oh, the probability is minus three. Can't be minus. Probability is not negative. It has to be positive number. There should be a big red flag that you've done something wrong if you monitor that. And so you reflect and you adjust. Where did I go wrong? Was it a computer? A bug? Was it, am I thinking about this wrong completely? Do I need to start over? Where? Every part of this has been investigated by the research. And this is what we know. In terms of assessing the task, Unfortunately, students don't assess the test. Writing instructors, raise your hand. As the, what the research shows is that students read enough of the prompt to understand what this is vaguely about, and then immediately start writing everything they know about that topic. That's also true in math. They only read enough of the problem to this, until they decide, oh, it's that formula. And then they start using the formula and only look for numbers from here and there that kind of look like they go in the formula. They don't read the whole text. And in fact, in, in that study, the students, some of the students who went on reading the text, once they had decided what formula applied, they misread some of the words later on. So, uh, like miles instead of minutes. So that the formula still applied. It didn't challenge what they had decided they were going to use anyway. Um, Marsha talked about this 
they are not good at uh, estimating strength of this. And then having a plan, they don't plan or they do it poorly. Studies comparing experts and novices on complex problems show that experts obviously take less time because they know more. But most of the expert time is spent planning and then quickly be lying to the solution once you have a good plan. Novices spend very little time planning. They immediately start doing things and then they have to backtrack and meander and, and take longer. In terms of monitoring performance, there's this interesting thing called the self-explanation effect. Some students, um, so let's say a student who's reading their book and finish a chapter and says, oh, before I go on to the next chapter, there were a lot of ideas over here. Let me do a schematic. Let me put the three main ideas down and draw arrows connecting which goes with which. People who explain that thing, what they're saying to themselves in that way, a huge learning goal. Unfortunately, that's a minority. And then in terms of reflection, what do you think that's going to say? <laughs> if you paid attention to the whole wheel, they don't reflect. <laughs> Especially don't adjust strategies. They keep going with more of the same, hoping that this time it will work. And especially if they have to learn the new strategy, and the new strategy is kind of time intensive to learn. And especially if the old strategy kind of sort of maybe works some of the time, then the incentive to, you know, invest in the new strategy is just not there for them. At the core of the belief that we hold about intelligence and learning. Is learning quick or is learning gradual? Some students in math have a documented belief that if you cannot solve a problem in 10 minutes, it's impossible. So if it's impossible, well, what's the point in planning, reflecting, adjusting, right? Um, and so, because of that, earlier research found that it was very hard uh, to the point that some people believe that you're either metacognitive or you are not metacognitive and you're not going to be. Now we've found that actually you can teach students to be a little more self-aware, a little more reflective, a little more planful, but it needs to be a very thoughtful, very deliberate, intentional um, disposition. And I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, the rapper. Marsha talked about the self assessment of values. Uh, how to make students more able to assess themselves by asking them, never heard of it, I know we covered it, but I don't really remember, yes, I could do it. Um, the rapper. This is something that actually Marsha started a friend of what a grant, convincing all the science instructors. Again, very intentional, very collaborative, very good. The, the whole college of science came together and decided. We want to foster more reflection in our students. And so all the professors teaching intro courses, intro chemistry, and bio, and physics, math, they all did this. So the students were seeing this everywhere they went. It wasn't just a crazy professor who makes them do this. Jump to this group. And the wrapper itself is, it's an activity that wraps up the test, the quiz, the exam, every exam that they took in every course was wrapped up with this. Um, it's just a, um, a, a, a sheet of paper with some questions that you have to answer. To, uh, and, and you have to do it in order to get your score back. And it's, you have to put your name, but it's ungraded, but you have to do it. And it asks you questions like, um, what was your score in the past? Where did you lose points? Well, then, what, what chapters, what, what topics don't you understand? Where do you have problems? Um, how did you prepare for this test? Given what you know now, given your performance, how would you prepare, what would you do for me next time, the next time? And then they get collected, and because you have their name, a week before the next test, they get handed out again. Saying, this is what you said you wanted to do this time. So I'm just reminding you. Okay? Um, what do you think they say in the, well, would you do this only next time? That is harder. 
to the readings, maybe don't leave them for the night before. Mm -hmm. It's very predictable, absolutely. I could have told them those things on the first day of class, right? Um, but guess what? They don't listen to me. <laughs> and so the reason why these things work, and, and she had, Masha actually has evidence that it works. Uh, it won't solve everything. I'm not, you know, selling, uh, a, a bit of, uh, a bit of goods here. But, um, the fact that they have to write it down in other names means there is a level of commitment. And they trust themselves in order to do that. And so, a bunch of them actually do make this situation become a little more reflective, a little more flexible. So, uh, but again, the whole college was doing this multiple years, uh, and then they were able to show effect on student learning and performance. One, one, one thing that I want to highlight before I let you go. Look at this cycle. This part, apply strategy, is the only thing that we actually teach in class. This is where I teach them, you know, statistical techniques and strategies. I trust that they will be able to come up with a good plan. I trust that they will reflect on their own and reevaluate. I trust that they will be able to evaluate their own strengths and weaknesses. We all do, more or less. But guess what? It's not a matter of trusting, or, or some people say, you're smart, you can do those things, you don't need to. It's not a matter of being smart or not smart either. These are all skills. Planning, reflecting, adjusting, uh, assessing. And as skills, go back to what Marshall said this morning. They need to be taught. They need to be practiced. They need to get feedback on those skills. And then, based on the feedback that they got, they need to try again, doing it better. So, for instance, I have started, somebody said this morning, um, I give students problems, and I ask them not to solve them, but just to practice deciding which thing is better. That goes in this line of reasoning. I give students some problems where I say, this is a huge problem, I'm not giving you this, but you can do this in a week. But your assignment is to come up with a good plan for how you would tackle that. And so I, and then I give them feedback. And this wouldn't work because of this. And so they start building those skills. Any ideas on how you could help students foster some of these things that one normally get taught in the country? Maybe things that you already do that you want to share with everybody else. Yeah. We do ask them at the end of projects or at the end of a um, field trip, something like that. Uh, there's things I have to fill out, but then I always ask them on the bottom, did you think this was a valuable exercise? Did you recommend this for the next year's class, and why or why not? And the why or why not is the crucial part. And yeah. they have to. And, and what I find is even some people who didn't want to have to do those certain things um, and thought I was giving them too many steps to do things, realized that I was giving them a rubric to plan things out and to have a um, uh, skeleton sort of for time management, and at the end, they get it. Mm. They're not so happy sometimes going through it, but at the end, they understand that. Right. Okay. Any other ideas? One thing I've started doing is when I give an assignment, I ask students to read through the description of the assignment and to look at the rubric. And then in class, I provide time for them to, on a sheet of paper, and I ask for their name, to explain what this assignment is asking them to do and how do they um, plan to go about completing the assignment and 
who might they go to for help if they're having trouble with the assignment? Excellent. You're killing two birds with one stone. You're talking about assessing the task and planning for that task. Absolutely. Any ideas from our other people? Okay. We are at time. I'm happy to stay a little longer and, and talk more, but let's let's take one more. There was a hand, and, uh, and then we'll close this. Okay, so I teach a research methods course, and um, students design and conduct and enforce their own research. I have them write these proposals on how they're going to accomplish their projects, which are worth a small number of points. And um, so they get that back and they get some critique about. And they also um, turn in drafts, um, also a small number of points, uh, which I grade. And they also have a grading partner mm -hmm. so they can get some intermediate feedback from me and from their, their peers. Mm -hmm. and, and, and guess what? In the real world, you will have to write proposals. This is not just, yes, it will help you foster that reflection and that planning, but, but it's also part of doing research. So it will, back to the motivational scorecard, this will prepare you for your career. Absolutely. So you're, again, a strategy that does double duty. All right. Thank you so much for contributing <laughs> all your strategies. And thank you. Thank Marcia, thank McKaylee, and all of you for spending your day with us. Have a wonderful semester. You're welcome. All right.